welcome to the LA Venture Podcast. This is Minnie Ingersoll, host of the podcast and partner at 10110. 10110 is a seed stage fund here in LA. All opinions expressed on this show by me and my guests are solely our own. My great friend and former colleague Austin Clements is with me today to talk about his new fund, Slauson & Co. Slauson is early stage venture capital with a mission to create sustainable economic inclusion. Slauson invests in founders from underrepresented backgrounds, and Austin does the same in his spare time. Austin was founding chair of Pledge LA and managing director of Grid 110 South LA. Austin, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Great to be here, Minnie. Well, let's jump in and start us off with Slauson and what you're building. Yeah, so Slauson & Co. is a pre-seed and seed stage venture firm rooted in economic inclusion. And uh, what that translates into is basically two different areas where we're investing right now. On the B2B side, we look at tools and platforms that support small businesses. Uh, so SMB tech, you know, pretty much if you're if your primary customer is a small business owner, then it's, it's probably in our wheelhouse. And then on the consumer side, we look for culturally relevant consumer tech. And really what that means is, look, we just have this deep belief that the largest consumer companies of tomorrow will just be much more closely aligned with the values and the perspectives of the customers that they aim to serve, uh, much more so than what we've seen over the last decade with large companies. So we're excited to see companies that are speaking very directly to specific audiences. And knowing that I know you, um, uh, <laughs> I know your area is going to be the tools and platforms. So tell me more about what you're looking for there for tools that are supporting small businesses. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's probably worth taking a step back and looking at venture and sort of how it's evolved over the last 10 years or so. The big picture is that as SaaS emerged, the lucrative and, and rational thing to do would be to target enterprise as your primary customer. The thought was it's a larger company and thus a larger contract value. When you do land a customer, you can get the six, seven figure, eight figure contracts. So you build out your inside sales team, you go after these clients, you land them and great, rinse and repeat. And why would you ever go after a small business owner? Um, because it's gonna take a long time, sales cycle, still high touch point, still high onboarding, all these other things. And ultimately the contract value is not <laughs> anywhere in the ballpark of what an enterprise. What's been interesting is over time, I think that that became a little bit too much of a hard and fast rule for VCs where people believe that like, all right, you've got to stay away from small businesses or SMBs. And as a result of that, it opened up this lane where people are completely ignoring the needs of, of, of a lot of small businesses that do actually want to pay for services. I read a statistic that five years from now, the average CEO of a small business will be a millennial, which is wow. actually not surprising. Wow. Like, like they're, they're my age. I'm, I'm 38, five years from now, I'll be what 43 and, and like, and it, and it makes sense. And so the business tools that they're using to run their small business should be as slick as the apps that they use on social for their, on their iPhone. Right. And that's, what's happening is that, um, there's all these new businesses that are emerging that are speaking very directly to these small business owners. But I think it's not just the large do dollar value possible with enterprise contracts. It's also the challenge of reaching all of those SMBs. So absolutely. Sure. Sure. So one thing that you'll see, uh, you know, some other with an SMB tech or some people call it bottoms up or things like that is a lot of these companies actually don't have massive inside sales teams. A lot of the companies that are targeting this, they're not, you know, knocking on doors or relationship building. They're actually marketing in ways that look a lot like consumer from the acquisition standpoint. So one good barometer that, that we have, or, or my good friend, Michael Tam, who was on your podcast earlier, when you're looking at bottoms up economy and bottoms up companies, like if I can't go to your website and sign up for your product, then it probably doesn't fit that thesis. If I need to schedule a demo and talk to your sales rep and do all that, and your pricing isn't transparent and listed right there. 
then, you know, it's probably not for us. It probably isn't a good fit. And so this is why when we hear folks that are saying, oh, we're, maybe we're starting with small businesses and ultimately leapfrogging and, and going to go to enterprise, it, it, it really doesn't fit what we're doing at Slauson & Co. at all. Makes sense. So selling to SMBs is really more like selling to consumer than selling to B2B. I'd, I'd actually argue that the needs of a small business owner are like, even much more simplified than say a consumer product in many cases, because like consumer products, you know, you, you, you're, you're touching on some emotional something else with a, with a small business owner. It's like, you're either helping me make more money or helping me save more money or I don't need you. Like that's, <laughs> you know, that, that's it. And you know, the other thing to think about is churn, which is another consideration. Also, you know, churn on in, in large enterprise SaaS is because you did something wrong. Um, churn, churn in small business in many cases is, is because they went out of business. To me, there's a wide open lane and the playbook is still being written by lots of, lots of really great companies. My, my minor plug for my own thing, I started a newsletter with Jen Richard, who's at Bonfire, and Sydney Thomas, who's at Precursor, called the SMB Syndicate, which is really about writing that playbook. So I'd encourage everybody to sign up for it. Oh, that sounds great. And do you think there's certain verticals or certain horizontals that are more open or are sort of more attractive targets? Uh, sure. Usually where there is volume, where it's highly fragmented. So like take daycares or, or plumbers, probably the biggest plumbing company in the country, I, I would assume owns way less than 1%. And so when there's fragmentation like that, that gives you a huge opportunity to sort of build a platform to serve so many different people. So that's the type of thing that we see and get excited by. That's great. Um, are, do you see a trend where a lot of the SMBs that your customers are, that your companies are selling into, are there, are they a lot of minority owned SMBs still? Yeah. If you look at all those stats, like even though minorities start the majority of businesses in California, there's this like very weird ceiling where if you look at the companies that are generating less than like a million dollars in revenue a year, like people of color drastically make more of those. And then if you look at beyond that, the, the scale tilts completely the other way. And so there's like something that's happening around where people aren't able to either scale their business or professionalize, or they don't have the tools or the access or the understanding or something like that. Or there's just structural things in place that are really just getting in the way. And that's part of what we want to do. Like if we have a, a portfolio full of companies that can help people out sort of break through that and professionalize their business and grow their business, then I think we're doing our job. That's great. And tell me a little bit more about AJ and his investment thesis. Sure. Yeah. I mean, well, to be clear, both of us work on every deal. So AJ and I have actually known each other since high school. We've been friends, grew up right off of Slauson together. Did you guys uh, go to high school together here in LA? We didn't. AJ went to Loyola and I went to Palisades. We kind of joke that we've been working together since high school because he used to throw parties and I used to design their flyers. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> strong. Um, and, but, but tell me more about sort of the investing in consumer products that yeah. are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what, what he focuses on and you know, what he brings to the table is like a consumer tech background. Um, he used to run a fund called Queensbridge Venture Partners, along with Anthony Soleil, who's now at Wonderco, and Nas, uh, who's still rapping and dropping good music still, uh, did some phenomenal investments there, mostly on the consumer tech side. So they were in uh, Robinhood and, and PillPack and Ring and Lyft and stuff like that. Um, I mean, it's some of them very early too. So his perspective on like really what can scale is next level is something that I haven't even seen personally. And in addition to that, AJ is also a master full brand builder. He owns a couple of restaurants and, and, and chains. One is uh, the parlor, which is on Melrose. Uh, pretty much everybody who's been to a sports bar in LA <laughs> has been to the parlor. But then he started a more mission driven uh, coffee concept called Hilltop coffee and kitchen which is actually based right on slauson right where near where we grew up he saw that that community was drastically underserved there was no like 
fresh food concepts that were around. And so they started Hilltop and it was massively successful right out the gate. He ended up partnering uh, with Issa Rae, who has the hit show on HBO called Insecure. Um, and they've been growing that. So he has a pulse on how to build products for, for consumers of what they want, whether it's tech, whether it's retail, whether it's anything else. So how that applies in the portfolio is we know that there are so many markets and so many people that have been underserved. And a lot of it is about like the language and, and where you meet people. It's like half the joke. If you're not part of that community, you won't get half the jokes or references or anything like that. And, and if you are part of that community, you're like, wow, like, like this is for me. And, you know, and you have a, a desire and an affinity and you and you feel compelled to be a part of it. So when you say that that AJ's got this great view on sort of what scale looks like when you're thinking a successful scaling business, what what is yeah. the perspective there? All right. So on the B2B side, we have a pretty clear outcome of, of predictability about like the trajectory of a venture based company, how much it raises at what points and at what stages and things like that. With consumer, there's actually this kind of odd but interesting divergence, right? There's some companies that massively scale, the Facebooks, Googles of the world. And then there's other companies that you don't know whether like they're they're in a position to scale that do do really well. Like say a Jamba Juice, which which benchmark backed, you know, is that a, is, you know, when it first started, like now, if that came to market, would people say that that's a venture company? Like, I don't know. Um, for us, we are trying to um, invest in category leading companies. So we're not trying to invest in one of many, we're trying to invest in the winner of this category. So, you know, we think about, we, we talk internally about those questions all the time. What have you learned from AJ? Just, he's a masterful brand builder. I would not say the same, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> sorry, let me, let me correct, but like, what, let me just leave it at that. <laughs> what have you learned from AJ about brand building, Austin? <laughs> um, so, so what I, what I would say is I am, first of all, first and foremost, I'm an introvert, right? And I'm like, let's be as heads down as possible, do the work, and then the work sort of speaks for itself. I, I think I've thought that for most of my career and I no longer believe that. Mm. Um, I do believe that you have to tell the story and, it, and, and I guess before I always associated it with bragging and now what Kareem always talks about is it's more about enrollment. Like you're enrolling people in, in your ideas and the things that you're passionate about. This isn't like I'm bragging. This isn't like, you know, everybody give me credit and praise. This is like, hey, if you're down for this cause, this is what we're doing over here. And if you like it, come rock with us. And so that mindset shift has been tremendous for, you know, I mean, even building the brand of Slauson & Co, which like ultimately still, I want the, the brand of our firm to sort of stand for something and, and mean something. And people know that we're re rooted in economic inclusion and know that we're backing founders that are underrepresented or often overlooked, but we have to tell that to people. It's not bragging, it's enrolling. I love it. I love it. Other thing that I don't have a good sense of is how do you keep a pulse on what people want? Like, especially if you're, you know, selling into a community that isn't your native community. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, but if you step back and think about what we do as venture capitalists, like all of these things you have to get up to speed on. I remember some early investments when I was at 10110, like I had to go become a, a, a semi expert in satellite imagery in, in a week and a half. Like, I, you just have to, you have to dive deep and learn and become passionate and talk to the right people and things like that and understand where people are coming from and understand the specific needs. And honestly, I don't think it's too much different than that. And I think that when a lot of VCs stay away from these areas or, or things like that, because they feel like that, I think it's more of a mental barrier than, a, than an actual or practical one. Like we're in the business of getting up to speed really quickly and then supporting where we can. So you know, I think it's the same way when you're learning about culture, like uh, when you're learning about cultures that are not as familiar to yours, you, you. Great. And uh, you guys are writing, what is your target? Is it like a million dollar check? Yeah. So uh, we do pre-seed and seed on the pre-seed side. We're doing between 250 up to about a million on the seed. Uh, we're doing between a million and 3 million. 
we lead most of the rounds that we do. So I, I think that's the other thing when you're talking about going to pockets of talent that are underrepresented. I, I do have a belief that you kind of got to lead deals. Like mm. you can't, you can't wait around and, and expect that a more established firm is going to see what you see. So what about that? Um, do you have advice for people who maybe are struggling to raise rounds? Um, and this could be in your, your sloss and hat, but it could be, you know, with grid 110 or otherwise. Yep. That was, there was no way I was going to answer this question without talking about Grid 110. So, uh, you know, this is LA Venture. Um, Grid 110 started six or seven years ago um, and has been serving so many entrepreneurs to help them lay the foundation for their business. Um, it's not just a, a, a program that's basically only setting you up to fundraise and telling you how to pitch and stuff like that. It's like, how do you think about strengthening your business? And I think so many people want to skip that part and just raise capital. So Grid 110, again, nonprofit accelerator, no fee, no equity taken from your business. Um, uh, and they have programs that run for several weeks uh, where you're part of a cohort, you learn from each other. And I'm a diehard advocate for what uh, the Grid 110 team is building. Right. And now there's a new fund also supporting the Grid 110. I mean, is that another good way to plug in? I think you're referring to the Pledge LA initiative. The South LA yeah. fund. I wasn't sure. Yes, yes, yes. No, that's totally fair. So Pledge LA and Grid 110 um, uh, partnered up. So Pledge LA uh, ran an initiative where they realized, uh, especially in the wake of, of, of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter movement and things like that, that Black and Brown founders in LA were being drastically underserved and in many cases didn't have the sort of friends and family round to work full time on their ideas or leave their job. So Pledge LA created the Fund for South LA Founders um, and actually identified 20 companies that they decided to give $25,000 to each. So it was a $500,000 effort in that regard. But in addition to giving the capital, we also wanted to give the guidance to these companies. So it's not enough to just hand somebody a check and say, you know, good luck. We wanted to say, here's how you could be successful. Here are the things that could tighten up your business. I'm really proud and, and that I get to witness how much they can achieve oftentimes with so little. So when you um, were chairing Pledge LA or, or your involvement with Grid 110, you know, what do you, what's my question? What do you think are the big levers that really move the needle? Or do you guys ever just like have brainstorming sessions? You're like, what are all the crazy ideas that we could come up with <laughs> that might move the needle? Uh, yeah, so, so Pledge LA was founded on three principles. Um, the first was like civic engagement. The second was diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the third was accountability. Um, uh, it's that third piece that is the one that you have to have a foundation of in order to actually move the needle. And sometimes it's sort of a wake up call. Like this will be the only time that somebody takes the time to reflect on these types of things. And then when you get the data back, and, you know, and the goal of Pledge LA was never to shame anybody. It's really just to kind of put a mirror to, to what's going on. Another thing that came up w out of a brainstorming session was a partnership with HBCU VC. So HBCU VC is a, a nonprofit. It's historically been focused on taking students from underrepresented backgrounds and, and, uh, and helping them learn about the venture capital industry. And so there, the partnership there was to place students from underrepresented backgrounds into uh, venture firms all across LA. And that's been running for two years now. And like, I remember how hard it was for me to break into this industry and like um, imagining that there would be a program that was specifically targeting people like me that could help me get and land roles. Like that, that's the most amazing thing ever. That's just, I gotta, I got to see what we're doing at 10110. <laughs> Thank you for the <laughs> reminder. <laughs> yeah, you should, there's a, there, well, the side note, there's a, there, there's an information session on uh, getting an intern for the summer. If uh, that's taking place, I think tonight. Okay. <laughs> got it. Good note. Good yeah. note. note. <laughs> um, you know, it feels like so many of these conversations have changed in the past year. Has that been purely a positive or does it ever bother you that it's so trendy? That's a great question. And um, 
I, I, I come from the standpoint of, I don't feel like it's, it's ever too late to do the right thing. And so even though last year, a lot of corporations, a lot of people started to focus on this and it seems like this is, you know, as a person of color, uh, uh, you know, like I've seen my community rally around this for decades and, and now people are sort of waking up to it. I'm happy that it happened, you know, like it, it legitimately could have gone on for many more decades. Not that everything has been solved in the last year, but what the last year did was highlight that there are very specific actions that you could take and, and you can talk to your employee base, talk to and allocate dollars and hiring and things like that. But I, I can get that some people would not receive that as well. Some people from my community would be like, hey, you know, like we've been talking about this and now you're now you're showing up and trying to act like you're great when, you know, your numbers around diversity have been off and things like that. So I actually don't view people that take that perspective negatively. I, I get where they're coming from. I take a different perspective where I'm like, hey, I'm glad you're here and let's work together to make some real change. Do you think there's anything that people are getting wrong? Um, you had a great blog post, the delusion about inclusion. Yes. I don't know that it's necessarily people getting wrong. I, I feel like there's just some misconception. Like people feel like if you're doing this it, or, or looking at, at, at founders from underrepresented backgrounds that it's charity work. And, you know, and I was trying to make the argument that it's not, it's an opportunity. And what I think will ultimately happen is firms like mine will will produce really great results and then ultimately inspire other people to to get involved and start taking a look as well. I mean, I welcome the advancement. Like if that's the competition that we're playing or how many people can you help out? I'm all down. I'm completely down with that. Totally. Do you remember this panel we were on? I think it was at Soylent. Yep. I think you pointed this out that after the panel, you and I were both on the panel. We were both at 10110 and after the panel, all the people of color lined up to talk to you and all the women lined up to talk to me. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd love to know more about your experience getting into venture capital. And like you alluded to, like at Morehouse, when you were there, there wasn't a program explaining what the world of venture looked like. So, and I know you spent many years at 10110, so maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, for me, it was actually, as I, I was running a, a dev shop doing web and mobile development for a lot of small businesses. I was wondering why the businesses that I was working with weren't getting funding. And I'm reading TechCrunch headlines like such and such got $2 million. It's like, what for that? You know, and which, which I still happens all the time, but, um, but it made me really intrigued by the industry and, and sort of the realization that uh, entire populations of people were, were being left out from this type of access, particularly populations that I know and am familiar with and have worked with pretty much most of my career. And so, you know, I went to uh, business school to try to find a way into venture capital, went to NYU, ended up coming back to LA, ultimately landed a, a, a job at 10110. But, you know, even that was like a process trying to find a role in venture. I was looking at firms in New York, looking at firms in LA. I, I, I was, you know, getting really frustrated and ultimately it was like, I know that this opportunity is here and I actually decided to start a pledge fund. I was actually basically trying to start my own fund at one point. I bought the domain name of Slauson back then. <laughs> I think I told showed that to David Waxman when I was interviewing with him for the role at 10110. Ultimately, you know, I think David saw the passion, saw that I was really interested and sort of dedicated to this industry and, and brought me on. So I am forever inde indebted to, to David Waxman. Um, I will, would absolutely 100% not be in this industry without him opening up the door. And so I, you know, I learned so much about this industry and how to work with founders and how to add value and things like that and have a tremendous amount of respect for David and what he's built. You know, I was going to say the exact same thing for me, which is David took a chance on me, but it was really <laughs> you, Austin. It was really you and David who hired me. Well, hopefully we get to cross paths more because I do miss of you course. at 10110. <laughs> um, of course, we're going to find plenty of ways to work together. Good. Well, Austin, I just feel like your personal mission and your work mission are so well aligned and it's, it's wonderful to see and... I'm excited for you and uh, appreciate the chance to get to chat with you today. 
always a pleasure to talk to you, Vinny.